Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, TV land. Welcome to WeBeam TV. This is Ray Aminat with Taboo Talk with Ray and Steve. And on this kind of somber day after what happened in Uvalde, Texas, uh, I'm going to bring in my co-host, Mr. Steve Reed, who resides in Texas. Um, hey, Steve, uh, how are hey, things going over there? Uh, things are going well here, but I'm about eight hours away from Uvalde, Texas. But there's certainly a, an sure overflow into my area as well. I'm sure it's going to kind of affect the way people think about yeah, what's absolutely. going on all over the absolutely. place. Absolutely. So, as always, uh, Taboo Talk with Ray and Steve is brought to you by uh, Heroes in Action, which is one of the sponsors. Heroes in Action is a nonprofit dedicated to violence prevention education on how not to be a victim of bullying or any form of violence, and that includes gun violence. Um, and our uh, today's show. Our topic is going to be on your personal safety and security, as well as risk management, with national speaker and a good friend of mine, Mr. Jeff McKissack, who's the founder and president of Defense by Design. Jeff, welcome yeah. to Taboo Talk with. Thank you, guys. I know both of you are also a Dallas resident here, so another Texan. But yeah, it's a little bit somber note today. And to your audience, we were, had already scheduled this program before yesterday's tragedy. But here we are again. Yeah. Um, again, it's right. We got 19 kids and two adults um, that are no longer with us. Can you kind of, are we desensitized to violence? Can you touch on no, this? I think to a certain extent, of course we are. And, and for a myriad of reasons, not just any one particular reason, but I don't care if it's movies, television, and I'm not saying that these things by any stretch of imagination, I'm not saying that video games and blah, 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 desensitize people to the point of violence where they would carry out these acts. I'm not saying that. But we just constantly have this drumbeat of violence, whether it's the news, social media, YouTube, whatever the case may be. We have this constant drumbeat and parade of violent acts that are put before us almost on a daily basis, if not a daily basis. And yeah, I mean, you're bound to become somewhat desensitized, even in scenes that coming out of Ukraine or whatever the case may be around the world. We as a people, and I'm not just talking about U.S. people, I'm talking about a worldwide audience, have become desensitized to much of what used to cause us concern and used to cause us heartache. Yes, our hearts still go out. But it's not the same visceral effect I think it used to be. Right. Um, I go to a lot of network meetings, and one of them I asked this question over three weeks because I was going to be the spotlight speaker. So I would ask the question, who loves violence? And nobody would say a word. Nobody would raise their hand. Next week, who loves violence? Same thing. Nobody would say a word. Nobody would raise their hand. When I was a spotlight speaker, I, I pretty much asked everyone, who can tell me what that question was? And they said, who loves violence? And I said, and you guys all lied to me. Because, you know, if you love watching hockey, if you love watching boxing, if you love watching MMA, if you can't wait until the next John Wick movie comes out, you love violence. You know, I'm not gonna lie, I love violence, but because of throughout our history and Steve you can talk about this you know back in your day when you were growing up <laughs> the TV shows uh, were not as graphic as they are now it, it, actually Ray I have to challenge you on that it was extremely <laughs> graphic especially back in the 60s remember when Batman and Robin were fighting the Joker or the Riddler and you had pow and wham and zap and so forth. That was the idea of our violence. And they never made connection with the person's face or whatever. It, but, but they had these, you know. Graphics. Graphics and, and so forth. But, but, you know, even going back farther than that, when you look at the old Westerns, 
yeah, somebody would get shot and, and they would, I mean, oh, you got me, and they'd fall to the ground, but you never saw any blood guts. Today, you see those same types of, of illustrations, and there's blood splattered all over the place. So we have become so much more graphic today than we were just 40 or 50 years ago. Now, part of it is cinematography and, and so forth, but on the other side of the coin, why do we need to be as graphic? Why do we need to be as blood and guts and glorify all of those sorts of things? That's, that's my big complaint. So, Jeff, is it more difficult for today's youth to be able to decipher the difference between fantasy and reality based on the video games, the music they listen to, the movies they watch, everything? Yeah, I don't want to get above the psychologists and psychiatrists that are really looking at this more in depth, but we're living in a world of virtual reality, augmented reality, so many ways that literally can confuse the mind as far as what is real and what is not. And for a generation that's growing up under that technological influence of those technological devices, if not now, certainly in the future, I think it's going to become more and more difficult to truly discern fact from fiction and even in real life and you know ray and steve both of you guys know what i do and have done for years when you're meeting people live have real life encounters whether it's a ted bundy type or even a bernie madoff type there are certain people out there who are the apex predator types in our society who know how to create illusions and perceptions of things or not in other words they know how to tweak reality they know how to use fantasy to create stories. I've told people for over 30 years, it's not a gun or knife, they'll get you. It's a good story. Well, what's that? That is taking something that's truly fantastic in the words fantasy and giving it the illusion of being reality. Whether I'm a person asking for your help to get something in my car, whether I'm pretending to be a police officer to lure you into harm's way, what am I doing? I'm augmenting reality. And in those type of cases, it's just as difficult sometimes to discern who's friend from foe, what is fact and what's facade. So there's a lot of carryovers here, even if you take technology and put it to the side. I 100% agree with that. Jeff, can you let our viewers know what are the major areas you typically address as a speaker? I mean, let's get to know who Jeff McKissack is. I yeah, know who you are. <laughs> well, both of you guys do. But... Uh, there's three main areas that typically I address, and they can be on a personal or a professional level. But the three main areas are physical safety, data safety, and reputational safety. And just to break that down, physical safety, you get it. Physical safety and security, yes, that's getting you back, whether you're going to Walmart or whether you're going to Target or whether you're going to Neiman Marcus. We all want to get back in one piece. That's on a personal level. But for companies that have employees out in the field or companies in the workplace, and whether it's through OSHA compliance or whatever, they are responsible for creating safer work environments to keep their people safer from instances of violence. There's a liability there. And so I help companies shore up those liabilities through training and documentation, paper trail and due diligence and all those. That's on the fiscal side. I have to stress on the data side, I don't deal with cybersecurity, I deal with data security. And if you're sitting there going, uh, what's the difference? Cybersecurity is when they're hacking your computers. Data security is when they're hacking your people. So there are social engineering dynamics come into play, impersonation, bribery, blackmail. How do I compromise an internal asset to get the information I want, either willingly or unwillingly? So that's the data aspect. And then on the reputational side, which is becoming more and more a hot topic today, what happens when people do things off the clock that end up affecting their companies on the clock? They post something on social media, they get caught on camera in a compromising situation, or going back to the data security issue, they are maybe set up or bribed in a situation and now it compromises their position within a company because somebody is now puppeteering them from the outside. So those are the three areas that I typically address when I'm out speaking, whether it's company events, whether it's conferences, conventions, whether it's client value add events, or whether groups just contract me to come in on various aspects of any of these three or all three of these. But those are the three typical areas. It sounds like you just described their uh, administration. Describe it. 
<laughs> yeah, Ray, you just oh, well, here's the thing. <laughs> Seriously. Three weeks ago, I'm watching YouTube and a Tennessee Republican congressman named Tim Burchett, which I'm liking this guy. He's become my new heroes because they were tapping him on why the government is so holding back all the stuff on UFOs. And if you really want to get me on a taboo subject, get me back sometime talking about UAPs and UFOs. I love Tim Burchett because he was saying, listen, he said, unfortunately, we're never going to get to the bottom of this because he said, a lot of my colleagues are compromised. And the reporter asked him, so what do you mean they're compromised? He said, well, good old Tennessee boy said, well, you know how it is. You get on these trips, you go traveling, you meet this good looking gal in the bar. Next thing you know, you're taking her upstairs and you didn't know but somebody had a camera going. And now somebody's got you by the you know what's and they've got control. Yep. There's a congressman admitting that about their own Congress people. Yep. So, yes, this is not just the fodder for TV shows and movies and spy games. This is the stuff that really, really happens. And people don't realize it, not just Russia and China. There was a really good article a couple of years ago by Politico that talked about how Silicon Valley has been invaded by a den of spies. And they were talking about how Russia was using bribery and China was using blackmail to basically get the information they want inside Silicon Valley. They were ha hacking computers. They were hacking people. And like Congressman Burchett was saying, it's not that difficult to do because technology may have changed over eons, but human nature has not. Um, we're about to go down a rabbit trail, and I'm going to try and get us back. <laughs> Sorry about that. I mean, we could we could talk about maybe maybe the son of a politician that gets a cushy job in maybe a foreign country like I don't know maybe Ukraine, and maybe he becomes you know on a board member or you know something like that gets paid millions of dollars. But but I know that would never happen. So we're we're not even going to. Uh, in that direction. Oh, that's just a figment of the imagination. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just, it's hypothetical, hypothetical. So, Ooh. all right, Jeff, okay, I'm, I'm going to get back on track. Number one, you've been doing this for a long time. This is something you just started doing last week, last month, or last yeah. year. You 35 years. So, okay, long time. How in the world did you get started in this area, number one, and number two, what what changes have you seen over the past 30 years? Okay, two good questions. Number one, the, the million dollar question always people ask me is how in the heck did you get into this? Are you military or law enforcement? No. When I graduated from college back in 1987, I was home with my folks, like a lot of college students today, twiddling my thumbs saying, what am I going to do now? And there was a gentleman that came on television. His name was Ken Wooden. And he was an investigative reporter and producer for 2020, 60 Minutes, and NBC News. This is a man that sat across the table and interviewed Ted Bundy, Henry Lee Lucas, John Wayne Gacy, a lot of the names we know, over a thousand of them. He did so to determine not why they did what they did, but how they did what they did and luring, at that point, children. And he found that the lures they used fell into 13 basic categories. And from that, he developed a program called the Child Lures Crime Prevention Program. So I'm watching him on TV. I'm fascinated with this. And at 22, when you have no fear, I thought, hmm, I'll write him a letter. So I hand wrote a letter, pre-internet, and said, hey, I don't know if there'd be a chance of working with you, but here's my phone number if you'd ever care to talk. Thinking, yeah, this guy's never going to call me. Six national, international awards, White House, United Nations, Pulitzer Prize nomination, all this stuff. He isn't going to touch it. Two weeks later, he called my parents home in Fort Worth and said, hey, I want to meet you. So my dad put me in a plane and went to Vermont. So he lured me, put me on a plane, went to Vermont. <laughs> And we just hit it off. In the next six to eight years, I worked as his apprentice, teaching his program to 250,000 K through 12 students in three years, another 40, 50,000 adult professionals. So by the time I was 25, I'd already been in front of 300,000 people live. And it's just kind of kept going after it. But the one thing that happened is in the late 80s, and we did this for Oprah 2020, Good Morning America, Nightline, all these shows, we lured over 200 men and women into cars and vans on hidden camera to show how easy it was to lure an adult. Point being, if we can lure you as an adult, of course, we can lure your child. But the thing that kept haunting me is, okay, if we're teaching the kids, who's teaching these adults? Because they are falling for the same stuff. And so it just planted that seed that back in 2000 matured to the point that tip of the hat, Ken Wooden and his blessing, I branched off. And I really focus now on adult education, but a lot of other aspects that came into it as well. And just really more focused on that whole risk management side, whether it's personal risk management or corporate risk management. And I've been doing that now of my, on my own for 22 years, starting in 2000. 
So that's how all this Reader's Digest version, of course, really transpired. As far as what's changed, honestly, not a lot. Because there again, while technology has changed, and there are certain hurdles to that, and there are certain things that come up because of that. People, you know, it used to be you meet somebody in a bar, and now it's, you know, swipe left, swipe right, and you meet them offline. There are some things that have changed, but the human dynamics themselves have not. People are still people. In the world's of Carl, Carl Menninger, the Menninger Clinic years ago, <laughs> he said, I don't believe in the criminal mind. Because everyone's mind is criminal. We're all capable of criminal fantasies and thoughts. And if you ever get an email from me, I always close my emails with a quote from, um, I'll just blind to the name. Ah, but it said, technology is not going to save us. Our computers, our tools, our machines are not enough. We have to rely on our intuition, our true being, Joseph Campbell. And that to me is the essence of what we do because we all have these survival instincts they are genetically encoded in us to keep us vertical on the planet yet so many times people don't listen or they don't know how to tune into those instincts and unfortunately it puts them in harm's way where they second guess the very thing that was genetically engineered to keep them safe they advocate to the intellect of the instinct and rarely does that turn out well in a true self-defense situation What is the biggest paradigm shift for most people when it comes to dealing with their own personal safety? This one is funny. I, I really did coin this phrase years ago, but I have now had so many people, and they give me credit for it over the years in, in multiple places all across the U.S. And I've had people even, you know, literally New York to L.A. say, oh, my gosh, I was channeling you last weekend because something came on our news. And it, we all have seen this and heard this. And I'm surprised that hasn't really happened in Uvalde yet. But there's a tragedy in the news and somehow the reporter will always find that one person to come on camera and say something that we've all heard before which is i can't believe something like that happened here because where we live we shop we go to concerts we whatever is so safe and there's this perception of safe place we even have these diamond signs that we put on buildings that say safe place and i've told people for over 30 years there's no such thing as safe or unsafe places. There's only safe or unsafe people. That is a paradigm shift for a lot of folks because most people are counting on the environment they're in to make them safe, whereas it has nothing to do with the environment. Pay less attention to where you are. Pay more attention to who you're around or who is around you because places are neutral, people are not. So, Jeff, as you're, as you're going in that direction, let's talk about some of the safe places, but specifically employers and companies. How do, how do these things impact the, the employers? And we'll talk both about the, the small mom and pop employer, the mid-sized, the, the corporate type employers, but also governments and schools. What, what are your thoughts and what we can do to be better prepared and have a have a stronger safety record all the way around. What well, comes down to empowering people and training? I'm literally working with. I don't want to get ahead of myself on this, but I'm I'm early stages of talking to a major U.S. police department about working with them on some content creation to, that they can disseminate through their various social media channels to the community and. You know, the one conversation I have with them, and the, the chief got it, their PIO, public information officer, got it. I said, guys, it's up to you to change the conversation, the narrative. Because right now, people look at you as their personal bodyguards. And they were like, mm -hmm. I said, until we change this and the education starts coming from the private sector and people start policing themselves and they start looking to their neighbors, their coworkers, their friends, their family as their backup, not necessarily you guys. You're going to continue to have the same types of outcry from the community. Something goes wrong. Where were the police when this happened? Well, where were other people when this happened? Oh, I know where they were. They were sitting there with their cell phones, taking a picture and a video of what was going on, but they didn't play third party intervention. But they'll capture it on video and make sure that thing goes viral so they get their likes and hits. That's where sometimes, again, technology has really changed the game. But I think with in that whole realm, when you're talking about 
uh, prevention, it has to be education. It has to be training because people don't know what they don't know. And if you think about it, really think about it, unless you've served in military law enforcement or security or grew up in a family of military law enforcement or security, my guess is no one has really talked to you about your personal safety since sixth grade. Because we have all kinds of stranger danger, blah, 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 programs up till sixth grade. But once we got past the point that we're too old for talking dogs, puppets, jingles, and coloring books, nobody's talking to us anymore. There's nothing really in junior high, high school, college, or the workplace. And the one thing I've constantly challenged the C-suite on and HR managers and risk managers, I said, understand that the schools teach your kids, your kids, a lot of things that they're really not responsible for, whether it's drugs, whether it's uh, violence, whether it's sex, what all these things. Why are the schools doing it? Because let's face it, parents aren't. Well, when they graduate and they're now in the workplace, who's responsible for those type of extracurricular trainings at that point? The employee said, well, that's not our responsibility. So imagine if the schools took your approach. Your kids wouldn't learn a lot of these things. So to me, the responsibility, the onus is upon employers to help keep their people safer through training and education. Cameras, alarms, access control can only do so much. And I'm not against them. I'm all for them. But again, they can only do so much. And if you have employees out in the field working where cameras, alarms, and access controls don't even apply, and you've got a guy in a truck working isolated hours at weird locations, and they've got expensive equipment on the truck, gee, what could go wrong? And things do. And that's just one example. Real estate agents going to open houses, property shorts. I mean, there's so many different industries, visiting nurses, so many industries that have risks related to what they do for their work. And again, who's going to teach them? They're past the age of K through 12. The only people who can truly impact them and keep them coming back safe day after day are their employers. So what happens in the ER is going to affect your HR. And sometimes if they do the wrong thing, what happens in the PD will affect your PR. But you as an employer have a chance to change that narrative, but you got to do it. So Jeff, you, you made a, a comment. You just kind of slipped something in there about cameras and technology and so forth. Have we become complacent because there are cameras everywhere, and I'm not going to worry about that because it'll be caught on, on camera, and it, but on the other side of the coin, the camera tells what, what has happened, but it's not really going to help you in, in the real time, okay? Yeah. So, so how, do we, yeah, how, how do we get rid of that false sense of security that, well, I've got cameras on my house, and uh, case in point, about three minutes ago, somebody came to my front door and they rang my doorbell. Now I've got a camera on the front door. It wasn't important, so I'm obviously not going to interrupt the program. But but we think about those kinds of things. We've got cameras. We've got you know dash cams and security cameras all all over the place. Mm-hmm. Have we become complacent? with a false sense of security. What, what do we do to overcome that? Well, the, the short answer to your question is yes, absolutely we have. We think that this technology is going to save us. And going back to that Joseph Campbell quote, technology is not going to save us. Our computers, our tools, our machines, you can add our cameras, alarms, and access controls aren't enough. And especially if you've got a worker out in the field. And if you look at some of these tragedies, where it's Pulse nightclub, Las Vegas shooting, um, Boston Marathon, all these different things have happened in our history now. Those people who were the victims, they were somebody's employee. They were someone's manager. They may have been someone's boss. And through an act of violence, how did that impact that business? And I've heard those stories from the C-suite and from owners and presidents of companies, how one act of violence had those ripple effects throughout their entire company because of an employee who was no longer at that desk, an employee who was no longer picking up the phone, the employee who was no longer behind that teller counter, and people knew why. And I've even dealt with companies that had to hire grief counselors and others to come in and all that impact. We think of family members being impacted by violence, but understand companies, coworkers who are those secondary families in many cases can be equally as impacted because they often interact with these people eight to 10 hours a day. There are so many ripple effects to violence that we don't truly calculate in, but we need to because only when we start looking at those costs do we understand the investment that truly comes with training and education to prevent these types of situations. 
And to your point, you know, I've had so many real estate agents come to me. Oh, Jeff, I got this new app for my phone that if I do this, it does this. And, and to your point, Steve, I'm like, okay, that alerts the police, that alerts whoever. How long is it going to take for them to get there for you? And you can just see that deer caught in a headlight look. Uh, oh, yeah, because you're calling the police. You're not calling Captain Kirk and Starfleet. They're not going to beam to your location. They've got to drive to your location. And you can see, oh, I didn't think of that. Why? Because everybody's looking for the magic wand, the silver bullet, the magic pill that's going to be that quick fix. Your personal safety doesn't work like that. It takes vigilance and diligence and all that combined with education and training. That's the starting point. So it sense. We got to take a break uh, for one of our sponsors, and that's Defenders Gateway. Defenders Gateway is an organization that uh, is a mobile app that enables first responders and veterans to be able to utilize uh, all of the vet friendly or uh, first responder friendly uh, businesses that give discounts to them. They also have a coffee that by selling all of these coffee brands for every batch of coffee that uh, uh, anyone purchases they make donations to foundations that actually benefit first responders and veterans. So we're gonna take a little break and watch this video um, if Rob's got that plugged up. It's finally here, Defenders Gateway Premium Coffee. Order yours today by land, sea, or air. Every day, millions of Americans sacrifice everything to put out our fires, mend our wounds, heal our sick, and protect our loved ones. Now all Americans have been asked to heed the call to give back to the men and women who gave their all. And remember, folks, 60% of all proceeds of Defenders Gateway Coffee go directly to our defenders and their families. Order yours today at DefendersGatewayCoffee.com. Make sure you check out their website at DefendersGatewayCoffee.com if you'd like to support our veterans and our first responders. Jeff, I'd like to get back to you. Since we're on Taboo Talk, how can safety and security be such a controversial topic with um, families, coworkers, just people in general? Because you cannot truly do justice to the topic without also talking about personal responsibility. And that can get dicey in today's discourse. And I have personally, and Ray, I'm sure you have too, and Steve, you may have as well. I have personally been taken to the woodshed, put up on the cross, so to speak, when simply taking a situation, because here in the Dallas area, I'm on our Fox, ABC, CBS, NBC, and CW affiliates from time to time giving story commentary. Ooh, some of the responses people have given me because of something I said, where it seemed like I was victim blaming. Well, no, I'm just dissecting what happened to this person saying, okay, here's what you as a person can do to make sure this really doesn't happen to you. Oh, oh, you're just victim blaming the person. No, I'm pointing out something that you can do better than they did. They didn't do it out of willful ignorance. They just did what they did. They didn't understand what the ramifications would be. But here's where we have a chance to learn from their very negative, bad experience to make sure you don't have the same negative, bad experience. But it's very hard to deal with some of these topics in today's world and social climate and political climate without absolutely being accused of victim blaming. It's like, no, you, personal safety is a personal responsibility. I've often said, and this is one reason I do have the rapport I do with law enforcement, that you do everything you can to make yourself safer. Avail yourself to everything you can, mentally, physically, accessory-wise, whatever the case may be, so that if help comes to your aid, it's an enhancement, not a necessity. That's the way we should order and structure our lives. We're not looking to someone else to protect us. And the same thing with kids. We just had a situation here in Dallas of a dad who let his 15 year old daughter go to the restroom at a, I think it was a Mavericks game or something. And she didn't come back. She was abducted. It looked like she was lured because she left willingly from the stadium 
A couple weeks later, she was found in a hotel in Oklahoma being pimped out. She was basically using human trafficking. The parents are now looking to sue the venue, the center where it happened, and the sports team and the police department for not protecting their daughter. Anybody else see something wrong with that? And yet in today's climate, that's perfectly acceptable to go down that seemingly vein of logic to say that was someone else's responsibility to keep my child safe. Uh, I have a problem with that on um, multiple levels. I'm sorry, obviously sorry for what happened. And it's a tragedy, but to put that blame on those other institutions and entities, first of all, I don't think anyone's to blame, but if you're gonna do it, let's look in the mirror before we look in the microscope. And so that's just one example. I think others, as far as the controversy is, sometimes you may be impeding on certain other territories and I deal with this and I'm Ray, you probably dealt with it as well. Yeah. There are certain people that see our work as a threat to their positions within certain companies. I'm like, no, if you let me do what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make your job easier. But that's not the perception of some. So there is controversy, even in the realm of trying to keep people safer. Jeff, you are just so insensitive. <laughs> I mean, of course you need to blame the, the sports team and the arena. I mean, come on. They're the ones that have the deep pockets. They have big insurance policies. So, of course, you blame them. They're the ones that are wrong. It's just it's the rich and greedy that are always getting... I'm sorry. I... Yeah. Yep, I but couldn't, you're right. I couldn't help myself. But, but really? you're right. We are we are we're minimizing and minimizing our personal responsibility. I have clients that I work with in my in my coaching practice on a very regular basis that they try to shift blame from themselves. Well, I didn't get this done or that didn't happen and so forth, but they always seem to blame other people. No, it's not life threatening things that we're talking about typically. Um, but it could be bottom line things for their business, for their, their companies, for their families, those sorts of things. But, but you're right. It's all about our personal responsibility and, and us stepping up to the plate. Now, there's another person in this scenario that you gave us with this girl being abducted. There's another person that is to blame, and it's the perpetrator. <gasps> Uh, yeah, I know yeah. radical concept. We we go after the person that committed the crime. Oh mm -hmm. heavens, <laughs> no, we can't do that. Well, they probably grew up in poverty. They probably had a problem in their home life. They probably, when they were you know four years old, mommy took away their Captain Crunch cereal, and they never got over it. So obviously, they are the ones. They are the real victims. So. Anyway, obviously, there's a, a hint of sarcasm in here. So, but, but, Steve, <laughs> unfortunately, there's a lot of district attorneys that are giving criminals a pass. <laughs> I understand, Ray. I wasn't trying to open up that can of worms, but it was there. <laughs> Low-hanging fruit, guys. Sorry. So, okay, Jeff, you got a, you've, you've shared a lot of great information, but how in the world do people work with you personally or in a corporate environment? How do people work with you? Can people work with you? Yeah, well, I mean, the obvious is you can book me to come in and do training. Um, Ray is also familiar with a program I put together several years ago called Trouble Spotters, playing off my tagline. People ask me, say, what do you do for a living? I say, I teach you how to spot trouble before trouble spots you. So I do have a train the trainer program as well that I'm licensing people across the United States to be able to do some of the programs I do. And actually, it's programs I've really designed for them to do rather than for me to do. I really don't do the same programs I teach others to do. So there is a way that they can obviously interact with me. We can do licensing and training where they become mini-me's in their communities to go out and do these types of programs. If they choose to charge for them, fine, you keep 100%. If they choose to do them just part of their, let's say they're a PNC insurance agent or they're a financial advisor and they're just doing as their community service to go out and do these programs in their community pro bono, okay, that's fine. So totally up to you. That's one way. So this, those are the two typical ways. Either you bring me in to do what I do or you become a mini me and start to learn to how to do some of the things that I do. And that little deal that you're going through on my website, believe me, there are so many programs <laughs> that aren't on there. There's a reason I call it Defense by Design because I'm constantly customizing programs. In fact, I've got one coming up 
in a few weeks in Pittsburgh for the Society of Government Meeting Planners. And these are 1,800 to 2,000 event planners who solely put together conferences and conventions for federal and state agencies across the US. And I'm their guy that speaks on event safety. Well, that's a very, very customized niche type program I'm doing for them that you'll never see on my website. There are programs I do specifically for hospitals that you won't see on my website. There are programs I do specifically for financial advisors you won't see on my website. So I'm able to talk at that 10,000 foot level or drill down to a very, very street level and really hone in on very specific niche markets and vertical markets. But the, the Trouble Spar program is more, again, that general 10,000 foot level, knowing that the person who I would be trained probably is starting from basically scratch in many cases, and they just need to learn the basic vocabulary first. And so it builds year to year with the programs that they would be able to offer. But those are two ways that they interact with me. You can bring me in or you can possibly become a mini me. One of those two. Outstanding. Thank you, Jeff. Now, we, we need to take another moment for another quick commercial break and introduce another one of our sponsors. And the sponsor, the corporate sponsor is a company called LifeWave out of Southern California, out of the San Diego area. And the founder of the company, David Schmidt, developed a product several years ago that deals with light therapy. Now, you don't actually see the light because what it's doing is it's reflecting your own personal light, the infrared light that your body puts off, and it's reflected with this patch. You just put the patch on your skin, and it reflects your infrared light back into your body. The patch that I just held up, that is actually our X39 patch, which, when put on your body, reflects the infrared light back into your skin, and it tells through a copper peptide, it tells your stem cells to become active once again. By the time we reach the age 60, our stem cells have pretty much gone dormant. This actually tells your stem cells to go back to work. Some of the benefits that you get with this particular patch is you're going to get better mental focus, better sleep, pain relief, you're going to get faster wound healing. One of the things it does also is it, it actually tenses up the muscles in your face. So you actually get rid of some of those laugh lines and, and wrinkles. I've been using this patch now for about five months. And real quick, when I first started using it, I had three major surgeries on my leg last year. The first one I was on, on pain meds for about 10 days. The second and third time uh, that I had the surgeries, I was using one of these patches and I was only on the pain medication for three days. It has totally changed my life from that perspective. So if you're dealing with constant chronic pain, I'm sure that we can help you with it. We're not gonna cure anything. I'm not gonna make any medical claims. But a, a promise, give it a try, and you will find some absolutely incredible relief from those challenges. There's my contact information. Feel free, reach out. We would love to have a conversation with you. Right back to you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Steve. Jeff, as a fellow author of books, just uh, as Steve and I have also published our books for our things. Can you tell us a little bit about your book, Power Proverbs for Personal Defense, and how can our viewers acquire them, get them, or purchase them? Yes, Power Proverbs for Personal Defense with the four written by Peter Piper who picked a pack of pickled peppers. <laughs> but now, that, what I did is I had people over the years saying, you need to write a book, you need to write a book, you need to write a book. So a number of years ago, we had a winter storm here in Texas for about five days, and when I couldn't go anywhere, I sat down on Monday, I finished on a Friday and wrote an entire book in five days. And literally, that actually happened. But it's only about 100 pages. He's like, that's still 100 pages. If you try to write a book, you know 100 pages. But what I did is I took the 10 most popular sayings that our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents said over the years, what you don't know can hurt you, better be safe than sorry, ounce prevention is worth a pound of cure, do unto others you'd have others do unto you, can't judge a book by its cover, well, except for mine. I took these basic sayings, and in about six to eight pages per chapter said, okay, what is the meaning of this proverb? Stories of people that did it right and did it wrong. And then bullet points and at the end of each chapter saying, now how do you apply this to your safety? So I joke with people that, you know, every one of the 10 chapters in this book, 
But this book gives you a way of looking at them and applying them that maybe you've never thought of before. But the cool thing is it plays upon the wisdom that we've had through parents, grandparents, and great grandparents. So there's already a built familiarity with the chapter titles themselves to build from. And you can buy it on Amazon or Kindle. And yeah, I'd love for you guys to do that. They're already showing it on the screen there. Power of Proverbs for personal defense. You can get in paperback, you can do in Kindle. No preference either way, but I really think you'll enjoy it. And some of the forward of the book, I had the director of the International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association. His comment front was, I recommend this book to anyone who's chosen to protect themselves with a firearm. Now, what did Harvey Hedden mean by that? He meant, don't forget your common sense. Yeah, you can arm yourself, but don't forget common sense. I also have statements in the front of the book from the HR director, Frida Lay, from the National Security Director for Dave & Buster's. For a lot of really, really pretty insightful people that were in the front of the book that have given it some really, really nice kudos. So I'm very proud of it. And probably next year or two will be a, a subsequent book with 10 more Proverbs, volume two. But I think you'll enjoy it. And certainly I've heard from a lot of parents that said they've used it on reading when they were taking trips or bedtime reading with their kids, giving it to college students before they went off to college. So I do think there's a lot of wisdom for anybody and everybody that reads it. And it's short reading but it's impactful. It's like that concentrated detergent. It's not that big, but it packs a lot. Can you give us an example of just one of the Proverbs and how you break it down? Well, for instance, you can't judge a book by its cover. Okay, we've heard that saying, but what does that mean? Well, in the world of impersonation and social engineering, someone that pretends to be someone they're not, whether it's to gain entrance to your home, whether it's to lure you to a negative situation, whether it's to gain access to your business or personal data and the files at your company. I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say I'm the copy repairman. Knocks and door shows up your work, one of the most invisible vendors that'll ever come into business. And now imagine you're a real estate mortgage or title company, and I'm showing up as your copy repairman. What are today's copiers? They're not just copiers, they're computers. So I walk into your office, oh, the copier's in the back. Nobody thinks that. that's the copy repair guy. What's he gonna do? He's not coming here with a gun, he's coming here with a laptop. Yeah, I go to the back and I connect basically my computer to the hard drive memory in that computer that you call a copier. And everything you've put on that copier is now being extracted into my laptop. What goes on the copier at a real estate, mortgage and title office? Think about those documents and you wonder how your identity is being stolen? That's a perfect example of don't judge a book by its cover. And I had a lady that works in an architectural firm here in Dallas just two weeks ago, I said, Jeff, thank you so much. We had some guys show up at my architectural firm and they didn't have an appointment. They didn't, weren't scheduled to show up. They didn't have any kind of identity for their clothes. And even the person who said schedule them no longer worked at our company. You just raised all the red flags, but they were about to be ushered past the front desk. I stopped them. I said, hey, um, that person doesn't even work anymore. Who scheduled you? We kept pressing and said, I tell you what, we're going to call the company, just verify that you guys are who you say you are. And they were kind of, she said, taken aback. Tracy said, I didn't care. When I got a hold of the company, they said, well, here's our car. She said, oh, no, we'll look up the number from our records because I don't know about that number on your business card. Again, smart. She learned from me. She calls and then she follows up with the line of question. I would, OK, you have a Joe and a Stan that work for you. What do they look like? And these guys, she said, they were just like bug-eyed looking at her because I've done this in social engineering on these hidden camera things where I would take a business card and pretend to be someone I'm not using a legitimate business card and basically co-opting someone else's identity, pretending to be them with their business card. But anyway, it all turned out okay. But when she hung the phone, they said, we've visited government agencies and not been that highly scrutinized before. So she learned from me to be able to ask those kind of qualifying questions that had they not been who they were, could have saved that architectural firm a lot of pain and a lot of liability. That's one example. I love it. I love it. I love it. You're bringing back some fond memories. Uh, from 2002 until about 2007, I was doing some risk management things with the company, well, with my company, and we were specifically targeting identity theft issues and making sure that, that the companies understood HIPAA regulations and all of the other things related. And mm -hmm. I walked into an insurance company's office, and it was a small sales office. I'm not going to say who it was, not, not relevant. But when I walked up to the desk 
as I walked in that front door, I could see they had a client file on the screen, on the monitor, on the desk that was sitting right there in front of me. I could have literally copied down all of the personal information. And after about two or three minutes standing there talking with or waiting for the, the broker to come, I told them, I said, do you realize that you are in major violation of HIPAA regulations and so forth and all of the other regulations? And she stood there with her chin, you know, hitting the floor. She couldn't believe. And, and it's, it's those kinds of things. But you're right, Jeff. It's, it's a lot of those common sense types of things that we don't think about those things because this is the way we've always done things. Why do I need to do something differently? So I love well, the story that you gave about that copier, that copier person. And many years ago, I sold copiers just long before uh, they were little mini computers like that. But it's amazing the, all of the information that people have in that copy are driver's license and all of the medical information and social security cards and, and I mean, and bank statements and so forth. It's like, oh, man, somebody could have an absolute heyday if they got hold of that information. So well, to your point, when you mentioned you referenced common sense, come on, man, that's, there's no such thing because common sense is not common but also, I had a buddy of mine, he was the SAC, special agent in charge of the Secret Service here in North Texas for a number of years. And Rob told me a story. He said, Jeff, I was over meeting with the CEO in a bank in Fort Worth. I walked in, I showed my Secret Service credentials. Well, how many people really know what that would look like? How many people have encountered the Secret Service? They said, I'm here to meet your CEO. And they said, oh, Mr. So-and-so, I'm not going to mention his full name on here. They said, um, he's not available right now. Would you mind waiting in one of our conference rooms? So Rob said, okay, I'm going to go in. He goes inside. They put him in this conference room. He said, I'm sitting there fuddling through my phone, you know, checking messages. And I happen to look over, and there's a window between our, my conference room and the conference room adjacent. He said, Jeff, in the adjacent conference room, on the table with an open door at mine and theirs, were a stack of solid gold bars sitting at the table, on the table at the bank. He said, had I not been who I was, my briefcase would have been a lot heavier with me walking out. No one thought to call, check credentials, and they just assumed he oh, was. It's oh, amazing. All right, so so Jeff, how can how can somebody book you? I mean, you're, a, you're a wealth of knowledge. Uh, you, you need to share this with more people. How can people get a hold of you and get you on their, their schedule? I appreciate that. Um, basically, just reach out to me at Jeff at DefenseByDesign.com. And again, I don't care what industry you're in. I'm very industry agnostic. If you understand from what we're talking about today, boy, my company, my organization, my institution, my whoever, my upcoming conference convention could really use this. Let's talk. And often I help companies find sources. because I don't cost an arm and leg. I really don't. But Less money is always good money. And so I always recommend sponsors or sources of income to actually pay for the training. The number one thing I always tell companies, reach out to your product or property and casualty insurance provider because many of them love what I'm doing because they know it's helping to mitigate claims of negligence down the road. And insurance companies are my number one clients, FYI, absolutely across the board because they get what I do and why and how it benefits they and their clients. So the first thing I always tell companies, reach out to your PNC insurance provider and see if they'll help either underwrite, offset, or cover the cost of this. You may find you don't have to pay anything at all. But there are other ways, and I help people identify those other potential sponsors or vendors that would be willing to do something like this. I've got several projects brewing right now to create video content, and all of it's going to be funded by outside sponsors that I help to identify. In some cases, I help to recruit. So there's a wealth of available funding out there to do things. It's just a matter of learning how to do it. But certainly, again, Jeff at DefenseByDesign.com. Let's start a conversation. So I'm going to pull a Jen Saki and circle back. Uh, we, were, <laughs> we were talking about uh, what happened in Texas with the shooting mm -hmm. and uh, before the show started. And you had mentioned that prior to the shooting, you had already scheduled a speaking event for, uh, I, I guess it's a school district. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, yeah, just a few weeks ago, I had a guy reach out to me. And this will be my second year in a row speaking at this state conference, but it's the Texas Association of Private and Parochial Schools. It's several hundred private, mostly private Christian and Catholic schools across the state of Texas. And they had already reached out to me prior to Uvalde 
and said, listen, we've already seen an uptick in aggression in our schools across the state and especially at sporting events where it may not be that school's students or parents, it may be the opposing team's students or parents, but we've seen uptick to the point that we're having a hard time getting referees to actually officiate the games because they're being yelled at, they're being threatened, things are being thrown at them, and then fights have been breaking out at, during the game, after the game, and they realize these schools realize we've got liability, and they're right. So this is going to be the major point I'm going to be addressing. In addition to my presentation, you've asked me to speak on two panel discussions as well. But again, that's just one example. The next week is when I go to Pittsburgh to speak to that group of event planners. So I'm all over the board as far as industries and events. But in education, I actually have, for those interested, whether it's a school or school district, a three-hour training for school officials and school districts to help them wrap their heads more around what are the internal and external risks that you have? Because every school takes students off campus for various things. And most don't realize the liability they have when they take students off campus before they bring them back. And again, these are just examples. I'm not covering all the things I cover, but at least planting those seeds that here are things that most people really aren't addressing, but they need to. Sure. So Jeff, with that, what you just said about taking the students off campus, if there is a if there is a criminal, someone the like the shooter, mm -hmm. um, if he happened to know what the the schedule was, because this time of the year, uh, a lot of times the teachers don't have any specific lesson plans, so they take kids to the museum, they take kids to the park, they take kids to whatever. There's a field trip. So if one of those one of those perpetrators knew what that schedule was, they'd have pretty easy pickings of those kids that are coming off that bus. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. But let's all not forget Natalie Holloway several years ago that went to um, where was it down in South America, Cozumel, one of the places with her entire senior class, but she didn't come back. Because she was lured away by a good-looking guy named Jorn Vandersloot who ended up luring and murdering a Peruvian girl months or about a year or so later after Natalie Holloway. So there was a senior class trip that ended in tragedy. Not because someone faced off against a gun or knife, but she faced off against someone with a good story. So, but uh, Jeff, I think we need to have you come back and talk a little bit about grooming because you've You've hinted at that a couple of times, and I, I can see where that could be a, a major topic for us to talk about as well. Uh, not just grooming, but also the UFOs, because the Martians are going to be grooming. So. <laughs> oh, you always need to get animated. Get me on that discussion. <laughs> okay, now, if I'm not mistaken, Ray, don't you know a Martian? I of think course his name is I know Bushy. a Martian. I've got them all behind me with all my books. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> By the way, Ray, when is Mushy going to be on the program? I think we need to have Mushy on very soon. Mushy will be coming out soon. We just got a, a scheduling conflict. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do for Mushy. Uh, I got you. His antenna arc on crooked or whatever. So, so anyway. we're running out of time. Jeff, it was, it's always a pleasure listening to you and your great words of wisdom. Um, as Steve said, your knowledge is unapparelled. You just know so much and are very, are very eloquent on how you present your craft as far as knowledge when it comes to personal safety. Uh, and it's a privilege to be a, a close friend to yours as well. Those of you that are taboo talkers out there and you have questions for us, you can go to our Facebook page Leave comments, leave questions, make sure you like, share everything, um, and Steve or I will uh, reply to your comments as soon as we can. You can go to our YouTube page and subscribe to that. Uh, don't forget to like and share those videos so that we get more people to hear messages like Jeff's on how not to be uh, a target for any type of violence or our personal safety. Jeff, do you want to talk about our guest for next week? I mean, not Jeff, Steve, do you want to talk about our guest for it, next week? It, yeah, we, we've, we've gotten on this, this theme of personal defense, and, and I've got a personal friend, his name is Doug Gould, and Doug is a conceal and carry instructor, and he's been doing this for a, a number of years, 
And he's going to be talking about some of the ins and outs, some of the regulatory things that we need to be aware of. Now, obviously, it's different state by state. He's here in, in Texas, uh, but he can certainly address a lot of the, the rules and regulations, Second Amendment things, things that we need to be aware of and, and reminders that we have this Second Amendment that says that our rights shall not be infringed. So Doug will be sharing some of those things with us and how we can protect ourselves with firearms in the process. All right, thank you. And as always with Heroes in Action, if you go to the Heroes in Action website, there is a donation page. Heroes in Action is a nonprofit organization and we do everything that's based on charitable contributions. If you would like to donate to Heroes in Action so that we can continue offering programs for our communities, without charging anyone, uh, just go to the Donate Now tab on the <clears throat> website and you can get uh, more information there. Um, yeah, if you could click on that, that would help out. Jeff, you got any parting words? You got about 25 seconds. Very easily, guys. When people have asked me over the years in interviews, Jeff, you could sum it up in one simple statement for people to take away, something that would help them truly protect themselves, their families, their companies, et cetera. I can't improve upon this one phrase. Trust your instincts. You know more than you think you know. Give yourself the credit for knowing it. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for watching. Time for your talk.